It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Ken Parrott uh, all the way from New Zealand. And Ken is absolutely, in my opinion, the smartest man in the world on water fluoridation. Um, I'm a big fan of your, of your website, www.openparachute.wordpress.com, where you basically have organized and listed every single fluoridation study and everything that's relevant. Um, the United States is kind of crazy in that when we, we decided to iodize salt, that was a national policy. When we decided to do uh, um, chlorine in the water, it's a national policy. You know, when um, put vitamin D in milk, that's a national policy. But when it came to adjusting the fluoride level in the water, the uh, United States had the great idea that every single city should vote on this independently. And the United States has over 19,000 cities. So on any given day, uh, um, 30% of the American towns do not adjust their community water fluoridation supply. 70% do. And every time you get five more towns to put it in, five more towns take it out. And mm. um, I've been involved in water fluoridation debates my whole career. And um, you're just a legend. So, Ken, so tell me this. Do you think the United States should make it a na national policy for the whole country? Or do you think it's a good idea to have 19,000 different city councils voting on this all the time? Um, I think it's hopeless having the councils voting. We've got the same situation in New Zealand. And the councils tend to be dominated by petty politicians, playing politics, you know, um, um, often have a strange ideas. And they've got no skills in, in understanding the science of it. Um, in fact, nationally, like in New Zealand, the National Health Authorities and, the, and our government recommend fluoridation. They say it's safe and effective. There should be no no reason for councils to debate the issue, except except if the population don't want it. Um, then I think there is a there is a even if if the local electorate if they're if they're being irrational, but if they're really scared of it, well, then education is needed. But uh, the, the last year referendum we've had in New Zealand has been overwhelming support for fluoridation. It's just the other day we had one council who had ignored the referendum supporting fluoridation and voted against it. And two weeks later they had to vote for it because there was so much protest. But councils don't have the skill to make decisions about the science of the health. That should be done centrally. So why, should be a centralization. So why do you think, uh, um, I mean, I don't know... Um, many other countries, but I, I know the United States people well, well, I've lived here 53 years, and in my opinion, um, Americans, there's just a lot of Americans who just don't like the government, period, and they don't want yeah. them putting anything in their water, they don't want them taking away their guns, I, I mean, you know, half my family thinks the government is the problem, and they're never the solution. Why do you think there's so much anti-fluoridation sentiment around the world? Well, there's a lot of propaganda. I mean, the the, the um, people like Paul Connor, who runs the Fluoridation uh, Alert Network, Action Network, he's getting paid by Mercola, who's um, a, a natural health, alternative health, health person. He's making money about uh, out of this ideology. And it's the same in New Zealand, that you find that a lot of the people who are very active on the question are actually natural health practitioners or very much part of that ideology. Um, so there's a lot of that, and, and the industry's putting money into it. You know, they, they're promoting those ideas. But I just think there are some sort of, there's a fraction of society who's tied up with conspiracy theories and they find them attractive and irrational theories. I often find, you know, in debating online with these people that they can be very irrational. It's very hard to find someone who will have a rational debate about the issue. And this, and this is home in my family. I mean, I was born and raised in the middle of American Kansas, and all four of my grandparents thought that the space landing uh, was filmed in Hollywood and a conspiracy to, you know, to scare the Russians. And, and I almost look at the anti-fluoridation. I almost look at anti-fluoridation or religion or politics as they start with what they want to believe, and then they work backwards yeah. from the facts. So if you just want to believe it's a conspiracy. I mean, how do you how do you talk a person out of that? Yeah. 
Well, you know, as a scientist, I'm used to the idea that we've got to have an open mind and we've got to be, I mean, the, the easiest, scientists are easily fooled by themselves. The only thing that saves them is objective facts. You know, they do the experiments, they collect the data. And I think as a human frailty, we tend to suffer from confirmation bias. Um, and if you could put ideology on top of that, you know, a conspiracy theory or a strong religion or a strong politics, you know, it's pretty hard to get through to people. So explain confirmation bias. Well, that's the idea that when you look at things, if you've got a preconceived idea, preconceived theory, preconceived um, um, ideology or something, and you look at something, you'll see what you want to see. I mean, there's a, there's a uh, famous video of um, a group of students playing ball uh, in black, uh, they're dressed in black and white, and the audience is asked to look at this video and say, who is it the black person or the white person that gets the ball most? They play the video through, and most of the audience don't realise somebody walks through that view dressed in a gorilla suit. They don't see it because they, they're, they're looking at the black and the white ball players. It's a, it's a human problem we have. Even scientists suffer from it, and we have to work very hard to counter it. It is a very tough process, and lately, um, the anti, um, I, and I still don't know if the internet yet is going to make the world smarter or dumber because when you search uh, uh, water fluoridation, 90% of the sites, in my opinion, um, are anti misleading, not based in science. And, you know, when the internet first came out, we thought, this is great. You're going to have access to all the libraries and science papers and peer reviewed journals in the world. But what you're really getting access to, is every other idiot's opinion on the planet. Mm. And when it comes to anti-fluoridation, I mean, when it comes to water fluoridation, almost all the sites that, that come up on a Google search are against it. Yeah, and even um, um, if you've got a preconceived idea, even the scientific studies uh, can look bad. You know, there's the IQ um, story. A lot of people get fooled by that because they don't look at the studies critically. And that's a problem because most people haven't got the skills to read a paper, sign up a paper, understand what the the faults of the paper are and what it really means. And they, on the IQ issue, that stands out like a sore thumb. But it's very difficult for the ordinary person to have that level of, of um, skill in, in reading science and interpreting science and understanding things critically and intelligently. I think in the end, so the things that, I mean, when I take, take my car to get fixed up, I trust the mechanic, mechanic who works on it. And I think the problem is that when it comes to health issues, often ideologically driven people try to get us not to trust our doctor, not to trust the health officials, not to trust central government, and so on, you know, and that, that's a real problem. Well, do you want to take the first one flying around the internet that uh, there's a study from Harvard that water fluoridation lowers your IQ? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's, um, that study goes back to 2012. What actually happened, um, the backstory to that is that uh, the Fluoride Action Network had actually done a quite a clever thing. They had hunted out um, poor quality mainly Chinese studies which didn't have, um, weren't, weren't on the, uh, on the um, English language um, scientific um, literature, you know. So they handed them out, got them translated, and a lot of them are very poor quality studies, one or two pages long, uh, and suffer from uh, not looking at confounding factors. For instance, I looked at a study the other day which did look at confounding factors, and they taken two areas, a so-called high fluoride area and a low fluoride area, and they found IQ differed. But the education of the parents differed. The, the uh, skill profession of the father differed. The ages differed. Ages of the children differed. You know, if you're going to look at these, this sort of difference, you can't just assume that one factor is involved. Yet that's, of course, what they've done. Even the, the 212 study at Harvard University, 
with a review of what, about 27 papers. And they said, look, you've got to be careful not to, you know, there's a lot of faults in these things. But it's been, it's been used by the antifluoride people as proof that fluoride affects IQ. And yet the only study that's ever been done look, looking at community water fluoridation was done in New Zealand two years ago by Broadbent and Matago. And they found there was no effect on IQ of community water fluoridation. And of course, the Chinese studies were done in areas of endemic fluorosis where levels of fluoride in the water were high and other, other intake in the diet through tea and pollution and so on. So that, those studies just aren't relative, relative they aren't relevant to community water fluoridation. So, you know, when I, whenever I see something on the internet, like the Harvard study confirms fluoride reduces children's IQ August 14, 2012, it's by Dr. Mercola. So what, yeah. what, 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 is, what, what is or who is Dr. Mercola? Well, you'll know him better than I, I do. He's a um, snake oil salesman in the States, of course. He's got a, a very popular site. He sells... Uh, supplements and um, health advice and so on um, and he um, he finances the Florida Action Network. I think McCullough and the Florida Action Network or, and an anti-vaccination group have formed a Liberty Health um, Coalition and that's where the you know that's where the money's coming from people like him. Um, in New Zealand we've got the equivalent situation where we've had um, legal action taken against some councils because of fluoridation and they've been taken by a group which is a lobby group for the natural health industry um, which you know is quite a big industry in New Zealand uh, and they've financed that so this is where the money's coming from for those sort of people and what about um, it causes ADHD yeah that, that was another interesting paper which got a lot of publicity last year. Uh, Marlon and Till did a study. They got 50 US states. They looked at the prevalence of ADHD in all of them and the percentage of community water fluoridation, and they found a, a correlation. Now, the thing is, correlation doesn't prove causation. And when you take the same data and you Include in the study, I did this myself, things like uh, median state elevation, um, poverty in the state, um, and house ownership. You find fluoride doesn't actually have any effect at all. Uh, and this is the problem with the sort of poor quality scientific studies where they haven't properly looked at confounding factors. They've gone on with the prejudice that fluoride causes something and they don't check out the other factors. But that got a lot of... A lot of um, Publicity. The same thing happened in Britain with the, the um, what was a hypothyroidism study, where the people who did that, the team was led by a well-known anti-fluoride activist actually, didn't consider iodine. And iodine is a well-known cause of iodine deficiency is a well-known cause of hypothyroidism. So this is the sort of problem you confront. There is a lot of bad science around, and it takes person people to develop some critical scientific skills to actually see through it. What would you say to um, people who say, well, water fluoridation started when toothpaste didn't have fluoride in it, and now all the toothpaste has fluoride in it, so we don't need water fluoridation? Yeah. Well, the research does actually show that even, I mean, obviously fluoridated toothpaste has done a lot to improve oral health, but the research actually so, shows that there is an effect of water fluoridation above and beyond that. And this is because the existing teeth, um, although when teeth are developing in young children, uh, it probably gets incorporated into the teeth and the bones, with existing teeth, there's a, the fluoride works through the surface. There's a fluoride concentration on the surface of the teeth helps prevent acid attack, demineralization. And uh, toothpaste will do this, you know, it builds up the fluoride concentration through the surface for about an hour then it declines. And the, and the advantage that water fluoridation gives is that because you're drinking water and eating food throughout the day, you, this helps to keep up the fluoride concentration on the tooth surface. So they're complementary. They don't, you know, they're not a substitute for each other. We should brush our teeth using fluoridated toothpaste and we should drink fluoridated water. What do you say to people who say, well, you know, 
uh, they banned it in Europe. It's not they don't use it all at all in Europe, and Europeans have better teeth than Americans. Yeah, I, I don't know whether that's true. I mean, the, the, there are some countries. I think Holland did ban it, and perhaps Belgium. They made political decisions not to use it. Um, but the the reason, I mean, some European countries, Spain. Um, Britain, Ireland, they, they use fluoridated water. Other countries have gone for fluoridated milk or fluoridated salt. Um, you know, in a lot of countries, fluoridated water is just not suitable. The, the reticulation schemes aren't suitable for a fluoridation plant. Or for cultural reasons, like the Italians, they um, drink a lot of bottled water. And that raises the question of what, how much fluoride there is in the bottled water. So in a lot of countries, you know, you look at, I think it's Denmark and Scandinavia, some of the level, natural levels of fluoride in the water are sufficiently high to, to, um, to, to approach the optimum levels. And in fact, some parts of Europe and um, Serbia and parts of Ukraine and so on, the fluoride levels can actually be too high and you have problems with excess fluoride. So it's not a... Community water fluoridation isn't um, a solution for everybody. It depends on, on the situation, what the natural fluoride levels are in the water, what the reticulation schemes are like, and for communities less than a 1,000, it's, it's um, not cost-effective to use water fluoridation. It's very cost-effective for larger communities. So it really depends. And this claim that Europe has banned it is just not true. Europe has made political decision in a couple of cases not to use it. But they use fluoride, the dentists use fluoride, they use mouth rinses in the schools, all sorts of things, right? So what, what made you um, get so interested in this? I mean, I look at the work you've done. How long have you been working on these, uh, like on your website? How long has openparachute.wordpress.com been under construction? Uh, so it's about 10 years now, but I really only became active in 2003. Thirteen, when my local city stopped fluoridation, even though we'd had a referendum. So I started to look at all the arguments that were being used, and there was a campaign to reinstate fluoridation, which we did win. We, we reinstated it. But I, as a chemist, as a, a scientific researcher, I had actually done research on fluoride in soils and fluorocylic acid, which is the most common fluoridating chemical. And I knew straight away that some of the claims that were being made just weren't true. You know, the thing that really got me going initially was the claim that the fluorosilicic acid, the chem chemical that is most often used, is loaded up with um, lead and arsenic and all these uh, heavy elements. Well, I knew from a fact, because we I'd actually analysed uh, batches of this with the work I was doing, and I knew that the contaminant levels were extremely low. And so, you know, I started looking at it further and, and well, what I've done on my website is try to expose all these lies that have been told, you know. Actually look at that when they talk about contamination, let's look at the levels. Turns out in our city, the, the arsenic contamination that we get in our drink of water comes from, from our source water. It doesn't come from the fluorosilic gas. It's extremely little on the fluorosilic acid. So, you know, there, there a lot of claims that are made just aren't true. And, and I think that's what annoys me most of all. I, I am, uh, you know, I'm a fan of community water fluoridation, but it, it's not what's got me going. It's the lies that have been told about the science. I really don't like um, scientific misinformation and distortion. And early on when my website first got going, I was interested mainly in things like, creationism and climate change and things like that, looking at the science. But this is something that I knew a little bit more about and I thought I could do a useful job countering what, what was being claimed in the political sphere. So what do you say to the people who say that um, we're not using natural sodium fluoride, we're using this uh, fluoride uh, chemical uh, that's uh, sold as a waste product from the fertilizer uh, companies or the mining com companies, and we're not using natural sodium fluoride. We're using a chemical that's a byproduct for manufacturing and mining. Yeah. Well, first of all, that the fluoride that occurs naturally isn't a sodium fluoride, it's a calcium fluoride, calcite. Uh, 
fluorite, a calcium, natural calcium fluorite mineral, um, it would be the main source of fluoride in drinking water for most people. Um, it can be very, the fluoride can be quite high when the calcium levels are low in the environment. But um, it just calcium fluoride itself will, will support about eight parts per million fluoride in water and that's just too high. But of course, it's no good using calcium fluoride as, um, as a fluoridating chemical because although it, it can produce eight parts per million, it's just not soluble enough for, for um, adding to a reservoir. And of course, calcium fluoride in the environment is contaminated with all sorts of things anyway. Um, sodium fluoride has been used a lot. It's a bit more pure form of, of, of fluoride. The, the thing is that in the natural environment, the fluoride in the water occurs as a hydrated fluoride anion. It's, 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 there's no calcium fluoride in solution. It's a hydrated fluoride anion. Calcium, maybe there's a hydrated cation, but fluoride is only there as a hydrated fluoride anion. With the use of fluorosilis data, that turns out to be a relatively cheap and pure chemical which we can use, it decomposes when it's added to water. So it ends up forming silica, which is like sand, and the hydrated fluoride anion. So the only fluoride species that comes out of your tap is the hydrated fluoride anion, exactly the same as occurs in nature. Um, and this is something that some people, because their chemical understanding is so poor, they can't understand that. But um, it's what a lot of anti-fluoride people uh, try to make use of. What do you say to the claims that the um, with the amount and prevalence of dental fluorosis that community water fluoridation should be stopped? Yeah, well, if you look at the data, um, in fact, like in New Zealand recently, uh, the, 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 there was a survey done and they found um, a prevalence of uh, dental fluorosis overall is something like 45 percent in fluoridated areas and about 44 or 45 percent in non-fluoridated areas and it was the same. So it's saying that fluoridation hasn't caused that uh, dental fluorosis. In fact, um, I think in the States they've got figures where they do show a difference, but the difference is, is only in the mildest forms. The, you know, you can break up dental fluorosis into the severe forms, moderate and severe, which is cosmetically bad, you know, people don't like it, they used to need to have some treatment to overcome it, or the questionable or mild or very mild forms, which is con not considered bad. In fact, surveys tend to suggest that adolescents and parents prefer teeth which are slightly whiter than this mild form. The majority of dental fluorosis, if you, if you look at it, although the dental people will say there's 45% dental fluorosis, only about 3% or 2.5% is in the severe or, or moderate forms, the forms that we should worry about. And none of that is contributed by um, community water fluoridation. The, I think the, the feeling is that the, where, uh, where, where the milder forms of dental fluorosis are increased in fluoridated use, it's because, probably because uh, people are eating their, <laughs> Their toothpaste, particularly kids um, consuming toothpaste, or uh, particularly in America, there's some regions where the fried levels, the natural fried levels, are too high. Right? But the, the thing is that the anti fried people claim that 45% is due to community water fluoridation. It's not. And the serious stuff is only about 2 or 3% anyway, and none of that's caused by community water fluoridation. I always think it's funny when they worry about fluorosis in the United States where 10% of Americans have zero teeth at 65, 20% have zero teeth at 75, and, and their whole mouth is filled with fillings and root canals and crowns, and they're worried about a fluorosis spot on the tooth, I mean, which usually can be brushed off, bleached off, whitened off. What, what, do, you, what do you say to the argument that, you know, the bottom line is the government should not be mass medicating our water. They don't put statins in there for cholesterol they don't put insulin in there for diabetes why are they mass medicating the people for tooth decay well it's um it's not really a medicine fluoride I and mean, in fact legally in new zealand it's not a medicine community water fluoridation um 
So that's a bit of a really hearing. But of course, we governments do and health authorities do make decisions and recommendations about things like iodine, folic acid in bread, iodine in the salt, um, selenium is a problem, too little selenium, and they can make decisions like that. Um, and this is really no different. It's really just uh, compensating for a deficient level of fluoride in the natural environment in some areas. Um, I think some people get very upset. They say there's no other source of water, so it's forced on them. Well, in fact, if you talk to most anti-fluoridation people who say things like that, turns out that they use a filter, a cheap filter which removes fluoride and, and other things, bad taste and so on. So they're being a bit disingenuous. And I think um, where, where the community as a whole supports a social health policy like this, like education or, or um, hospitals, if they support it, then the, the minority who don't should be responsible enough to take alternative measures. You know, in New Zealand we've got so good free and secular education, and there are some people who don't like that. Well, they pay school fees and they send their kids to a private school. Or they don't like public hospitals, so they go to a private hospital. Well, in this situation, if you don't like fluoride and water, but the rest of the community does, well, then the responsible thing to do, use a filter or use in a different source of water. And you find that a lot of the people are raving on about it actually too anyway, so it's not they're not they're not really being put out by it. Yeah, I what um to me what motivates me so much is um like I say I graduated in eighty seven. So can, can I tell you my my water fluoridation story? Yeah. Uh, so so I went to dental school, born and raised in Kansas, which is in the middle of the United States. Um when we were in dental school, it was so hard to get the pediatric dentistry requirements of two pulpotomies and two chrome steel crowns on a baby tooth, a root canal on a baby tooth. It was almost impossible. And, and this rich dentist had died named Lowry, and every Tuesday, his will paid for a school bus to go pick up poor second graders in the inner city and bring them in, and the dental school would fix up all their teeth. And we'd be waiting for those kids to get off that bus, just salivating, hoping they had a cavity or something to get our requirements. And they almost never did. And you would ask the kid, do you have a toothbrush? No. Do you floss? No. You do his x-rays and exam, and you'd be lucky to find anything. So then I graduated from Kansas City, and I moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And it seemed like one or two out of every five children that came in my practice needed a pulpotomy and a chrome steel crown and just wild decay. And I figured out instantly that Kansas City was, had community water fluoridation, and Phoenix didn't have fluoridation. So I got out of school in 87, we formed a committee with the dean of the dental school, Jack Dillenberg, and we got fluoride in the water. But what I've noticed uh, now that it's 2016 is that the poor people benefit from this the most because they're all drinking city water at home, at school, out of their garden hose, and it's the middle class and the rich who have money who are buying bottled water. Most of it huh? just comes straight out of a reverse osmosis. And what just tickles me the most is that the poor people who can't afford to go to the dentist and don't have dental insurance are benefiting the most. And the people that, have, that uh, can afford to drink bottled water all the time, usually they have dental insurance and they're just paying for their decay. I, I think the next, the next public health measure is people start to need to start labeling bottled water better, like this does not have fluoride in it or this does have fluoride in it. Um, yeah. So, so I almost think it's a Robin Hood thing. I mean, we're, 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 we're taking money from the rich and fluoridating the water. And, and plus in America, if a kid has bad teeth and no money, I mean, America doesn't have socialized medicine like Canada and Australia and New Zealand. I mean, there's no real safety net for them. You know, we're not like, yeah. uh, we're not like uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, where, you know, they have better s social safety nets. Um, so, you know, it's just a... Uh, Crazy, crazy deal, but uh, they, they seem to get crazier. Um, what, other, what other debates are you seeing on the internet now flying around? Well, the, the IQ one is something the Fluoride Action Network is pushing very hard. Because um, whereas the current recommendations for fluoride level are determined by research, which, which um, balances the degree of 
fluorosis, dental fluorosis against the benefits. Um, the, the, the people like Connor Taras, the Product Action Network, uh, are trying to get um, people to adopt a method where they accept the Chinese IQ research and 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 lower the the recommended level down. Well, they want it below zero, so they're pushing very hard on that. I pick up that. At the moment, because of what's happened in Flint with the, the, the poison water there, and people are concerned about lead in their water, the um, Fluoride Action Network is pushing very hard the story that fluorosilic acid um, causes lead to dissolve out of the pipes and brass and so on, and raise the lead levels in the um, drinking water. And I think they're going to try and push that very hard uh, soon, yeah. So I think that's a big story will become. I do yeah. think it's funny when they just scream at those debates like, uh, keep the government out of my water. It's like, dude, yeah. the government brings you your water. I mean, do you, do, you, <laughs> do you think you went out and laid that pipe yourself all the way to the river? I mean, they're just – I'll tell you, I love going to those um, anti-fluoridation campaigns because it really makes you understand the nature of man. I, I think um, at the end of the day, Earth is uh, – the surface of Earth is infected with 7,000 talking monkeys. And, uh, you know, they all, everybody thinks they're as smart as an iPhone or a computer or whatever, but they're just literally, most of them are batshit crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and as part of, there is a general problem, um, you know, that scientists complain about these days, and that uh, there's a lot of anti science, anti intellectualism around, you know, where. We're signed to, oh, you, you know, people say, oh, the government pays you, so therefore we can't trust what you say. Well, the government pays scientists and they pay other experts to do jobs to get the knowledge which is required. And the very fact that they're being paid is, is going to be used against them. Um, there is a shocking attitude amongst a small part of the population towards experts and towards scientists, towards teachers and so on. Yeah, I, you know, I heard them, you know, if you, if you quote the Centers for Disease Control or the World Health Organization, they immediately shut it down and say, well, that's the government. They're in on it. Yeah. So then I say to them at these deals, here I am, a short, fat, bald, humble dentist, you know, not pretentious. And I'm like, well, why do you think I'm for it? I mean, this, this is, you know, I'm not an expert in plumbing or carpentry or electric. electric I, this is all I do. Why do you think I'm in on it? And they look me right in the eye and say, because you know this will model the teeth, and then they'll have to be repaired with expensive crowns. And, I, and I'm mm. down there like, you know, in a pair of jeans and a T-shirt saying, so you think I'm really doing this just so that I'll get, make more money selling crowns? And they say, absolutely. And I'm just yeah. like, oh, my God. I mean, it's just – and it's funny because dentists work so – I'm so proud of the dentists because they work so hard to reduce their disease. I mean, I mean every – hour you spent working on water fluoridation is taking money out of your paycheck. Yeah. And also, a thing I heard locally when, you know, three years ago when there was this campaign to try and get fluoridation put back, there was just so much controversy around that a lot of people, a lot of dentists, a lot of health people just refused to participate because they felt threatened. In fact, some, you know, the... Uh, the District Health Board said they wouldn't allow their staff to participate in some of the debates because of this. There was just so much hostility from the small group of people. They're small and they're vocal, they're well organised. Um, they know how to manipulate local bodies, local councils. Uh, yeah, my I, I have four sons and one of them has asked me to stop doing this for those very reasons. He says, Dad, there's just a lot of crazy people, and this just really, really upsets the craziest people. And, and yeah, he has asked. He said, you know, you're so um, – I mean, they know where you live. They know where you work. You're so uh, transparent. They said, yeah. So my, my son has asked me several times to stay – you know, just drop it. And, um, mm -hmm. in fact, you know what I actually thought of on the last water fluoridation deals? Sometimes I think maybe we should just join them. And I thought, well, maybe I should just start an all-natural toothpaste with no fluoride and just have it all natural and five ingredients. Say, you know what? If this is what you want to, if this is what you want, I'll, I'll, I'll just sell it to you. Yeah. Well, that's what happens. There are crooks that are doing that.
Yeah, I mean, it, it's almost like, you know, I, I don't want to fight you. I'll just join you. But, you know, I've done the fight twice. If it comes back in 20 years, I'll be, uh, I'm 53. I'll be uh, same age as you. I don't know if I have the energy to do it again. Do you still have the energy? To, you're, you're still doing it, though. So you're, you're my role model. You're my idol. You're, you're still fighting the good fight. Yeah, you know, like, I think it's important to stand up against ignorance and it's important to try and explain the science. But at the same time, there is a group of people, that, you know, a proportion of the population who will never be convinced um, that it is just pointless talking to them. And I mean, I get into to debates online about the issue and I always think to myself, well, the particular person I'm debating with is an idiot. He'll often, he or she will often show that in the things they say. And I'm not going to convince them, but there will be other people around who, who will read it. And they won't say anything, but they'll be affected by it. I think it is important to stand up for that reason, even though at times you, you often feel that, you know, there's a, all you can see is the opposition that you're encountering. I think there are people out there who appreciate it. No, that, that, that's good motivation for you. You're, you're actually motivating me, because the, the last one kind of really exhausted me. And I think that's, a, you know, we got it in the water again. And, you know, the deans of the dental school, Jack Dellenberg, showed up. You know, it was a war, but it was an exhausting war. And, um, you know, I, I, I actually debated that uh, Paul Connett um, um, at the uh, live on stage. I put on YouTube, and the comments after the YouTube debate about me are just like, I mean, it's just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they also get personal. They go, who would take health advice from a fat guy? And it's like, it was like, all right. And uh, I noticed that didn't get me to lose weight. But uh, so, so I don't want to get off topic here, but I, I want to get off topic for the um, scientific process. Um, a lot of these people also think the whole global warming is a conspiracy. Where, where do you weigh in on that? That it's a um, government thing to take away our gas and our cars and all the scientists yeah. uh, on climate, they all work for universities and that if they publish a paper – that says it's no big deal, they'll be fired, so the only way they can keep their job is all the climatologists have to keep saying this or they're all going to get fired. What, what, where do you weigh in on that? Yeah, it's a load of old rubbish. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I've, I've debated all, you know, online with people on the climate change issue, and, and I think what, what, hap what has been happening is a very, I mean, Fluoridation is very complex, but of course climate change is even more complex and it does need experts to look at it and, it, and we have a process going now where experts around the world are having an input, they're publishing stuff, it's getting reviewed, reviewed all the time and peer review and so on, and they're coming to conclusions and the governments have asked them to do that. They want to know what the story is and whether they sh what action they should take. Um, and I think it's very arrogant to reject um, the findings that they've produced just because you're not happy about them. Or, you know, some people are rejecting it because they they involved in the oil industry or the coal industry or something like that. But I think it's very arrogant for the ordinary person to take the attitude that you can wipe off, wipe away all those experts and their, their findings just by uh, claiming that it's a conspiracy. It's just silly. Yeah. Um, by the way, I lectured in Auckland, New Zealand, and um, I seriously thought it was probably the most beautiful country on earth. I mean, that's where they filmed Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah, but down the South Island, that's where you, where you should really go. Yeah, well, I, I did. I when when I went there, I did the uh, the tourist thing, and I took the bus rides, and you know, if it, it's a fifteen hour flight from uh, Phoenix to Auckland. So when you fly a fifteen hour flight, you know, you stay a few extra days. And yeah. uh, I, I just was stunned at the beauty. I mean, that was just unbelievable beauty. So you're a, you're a lucky man. So what else do you want to talk about? Is there any, anything else? Uh, well, uh, what, what's a good source of information? I, I personally like your website uh, the most. Um, yeah, well, I've tried to provide information on that. Probably, probably at too high a level, but as a scientist, I'm trying to explain the science when perhaps there's more um, popular uh, popular levels required. But there, there's a couple of sites in the uh, States. I, I like My Teeth, I think is one of them. Uh, my Teeth? My Teeth or something, like Teeth. Um, what, what about PubMed? 
Well, PubMed is, is really just a indexing service for scientific publications. You gotta be careful. I, I, I came across one anti-fluoride person who said, look, fluoride is bad. He said he did a search on Google or PubMed or somewhere and he searched for fluoride and toxicity and he got thousands of, of um, hits. So I said to him, you search for water and toxicity and if you'll get millions of hits. I mean, yeah. Search for what really, and toxicity? Water and toxicity. You know, if you, if you think fries toxic because of the number of hits you get on Google or, or um, PubMed, the water is even more toxic. It's just silly. Yeah. So, um, any any other uh, any other issues you want to talk about? Um, any anything else on the fluoride debate? Any advice? Well, I'm not I'm not a very political person. I I know um, in New Zealand, since the the situation in my city in Hamilton, um, there's been an online group for making sense of fluoride, and and, and there's a lot of people who've joined that from other countries, America, Ireland, Australia. And that's a good good place for, if you've got an interest, to get on that Making Sense of Fluoride Facebook site and if you can, to actually join the group because you keep up to date with all the issues that are coming up and people are checking out their, um, you know, they, they, they might prepare a document and they ask people to look at it, you know, that sort of thing. So that's quite a good site. And I know I've met people from States and Ireland and Australia through that, so I think that's a good good place. A lot of people go go do like Facebook, and that's a good place on Facebook. Making sense of fluoride. Make so it's Facebook.com. Making sense of fluoride. Yeah, just search for making sense of fluoride. F L. Okay. Um, Okay, that's a good source. And then, of course, your website, openparachute.wordpress.com. That's my favorite site. Um, any, uh, do, do you think the Centers for Disease Control studies are up to date? A lot of people say, well, you know, the CDC, the Kingston Newberg studies, all these studies were done back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they say, you know, the Centers for Disease Control hasn't undertaken um, big new studies since the you know the turn of the new uh, millennium. Do you do you agree with that or disagree? Well, I'm not familiar enough, but I've found a lot of the American sites uh, very bureaucratic, very difficult to search through. Um, the CDC is like that. There, there's um, there's another group, a natural toxicity program, national toxicity program, or something, which is going to look at this question of, um, well, it's actually going to do a review of the literature looking at the IQ and fluoride question, plus a few animal studies. And I've made some contributions to that, but in trying to get onto that site, it's very difficult to work around it. So, but yeah, I, I think apart from that, there are, there are reviews like New Zealand has got a very good up-to-date review done by the uh, Royal Society of New Zealand and the Office for the Prime Minister's Chief Scientific Advisor. Um, it was done in 2014. It was on the health health um, situation regarding fluoride. And it was actually done for councils, local councils who kept asking for a scientific source. Um, so that's a good review, good up to date. The Cochrane Review is a little bit more recent. It's, there's a lot of problems with that because of the way it's expressed. Um, but I think the Americans and the Irish, and I think the British have got recent reviews as well. I don't know how how closely uh, CDC follows those. Okay. Well, hey, hey um, again, I think uh, for anybody listening to this, if you just want to have go to the most amazing uh, website ever, openparachute.wordpress.com, uh, Ken Parrott has a uh, PhD in chemistry in 1970, and he is one of the most analytical, non-emotional, scientific uh, works I've, I've, I've ever seen on community water fluoridation. Whenever I'm talking to a dentist around from here to Texas to wherever, talking about a fluoride debate, um, everybody goes to your site. Everybody's using it. And uh, I just want to tell you that. Uh, and by the way, it's posted on, on Dentaltown. 
uh, is 210,000 dentists, and one of the issues, one, one of the forms is health issues, and under that's water fluoridation. And uh, you're, you're quoted on that all the time. Uh, links to your okay. website are on that all the time. Uh, if you ever want to join Dental Town and, uh, and say hello to everyone, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. But I just really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your, your love for science, your love for the answer. You don't have an agenda. You just, you just take your free time to stand up to ignorance. I think that's just amazing. Mm, that's very nice of you to say that. And I also encourage comments on, on the blog. An open parish, and they can be quite entertaining at times. Yeah, and and you're you're a role model to me because you're uh, you're 20 years older than me, and you're still grinning, and you're still smiling, and you're still fighting. And I literally thought after the last fluoride debate that I was done. I mean, I was just maybe maybe I just needed to take a year off and uh, recoup and and uh, uh, pull myself back together again. But I, I hope when I'm 72. Because uh, that's what about every twenty years, you know, they it, it expires. Every time they put it in the water, they have an expiration date, and oh, yeah. uh, so you know it'll expire again. And uh, I'm sure you'll have another hundred studies up there in the next twenty years. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, science is like that. It should always be reviewed. Right. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, Ken. Uh, so thank you so much for your time, and thank you for all that you do for dentistry, for community water fluoridation, and like say, uh, um, your your stuff is read from dentists and literally in every country from around the world. So thank you so much for all that you do. Well, thanks very much for having me. All right. Have a great day, Ken. You too. Okay. We'll bye. -bye. See you again. And by the way, if if anything ever, if you ever add anything, or if you ever want. Um, if you ever have something you want put out on your ward or whatever, just email it to me, Howard at dentaltown dot com, and I'll put yeah. it out. I'll send it. I'll put it in front of three hundred thousand dentists for you. So whenever you got something to say or something new or whatever, uh, I'll be your I'll be your marketing man.